Hello and welcome to the Stories of Northern Life, a podcast brought to you by the Sault Ste. Marie Museum, sharing the heritage of Northern Ontario and the culturally rich stories in everyday life. We bring the events and people of the Sioux's past to a new light and capture the stories of changemakers in our Northern community today. And welcome to uh, the Stories of Northern Life podcast and this museum. <laughs> Hi, Thanks for having me in. Yes. I'm super excited because I've seen you around the museum multiple times at this point, And I'm excited to dive deeper into finding out who you are. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> so can I first get you to introduce yourself in your own words? Sure. My name is Mark Dunn and I live in Sault Ste. Marie. Awesome. <laughs> are you from the Sioux? <laughs> I am from the Sioux. I was born here. Uh, many years ago and lived most of my life here. Maybe there's like a decade spread out over 50 some years where I was elsewhere, but mostly I've been here. Yeah. 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 Um, so what was like kind of like childhood like for you? Where whereabouts did you live? Childhood. So I grew up on the, um, well, what was then the outskirts of town, like Black Road area. Okay. And um, we had no street lights, no sidewalks, <laughs> no cable TV. <laughs> and we all had well water. And uh, it was lovely, actually. It, it was really nice. We had, um, like, behind my house was just forests and rivers going all the way to Garden River. And, wow. Um, I guess in front of the house was like that, too. And uh, it was quite bucolic and little farms and, and things. And, uh, yeah, my so my, most of my childhood was just, like, running around outside. Yes. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> so <laughs> what inspired your interest in music, then? I think I was born that with that. Like my father um, sang in uh, country bands. In, oh, okay. Yeah, he had a really great country voice, and um, so there were always. No, I would say always, but the, when I was little, like in the seventies, um, he was really active doing that. So there were always musicians around the house and that, cool. and playing the old country songs, and um, which I didn't appreciate at the time, but I do. I do now. Yeah. Um, so I grew up with music there, and then I just. Like many kids, I'd just make up songs and stuff. And then when I was 13, I got my first guitar. So I was able to, I was writing songs. So that was the purpose of getting and trying to learn the guitar so that I could remember the songs. Mm. And uh, from then on, like I've, I've just kept it up for 43 yeah. years or whatever. Just, um, just about every day I play it. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's amazing. So, did you take technical lessons at any no, point? Never. No, I took uh, I took a few bass lessons in uh, in high school from a guy because I, I wanted to play bass and I didn't know what that was about. Yeah. So I, I took maybe a summer of bass lessons, which was helpful. I learned all the uh, where all the notes are on the fretboard. But no, I just I've learned just by listening and playing with people. Wow, that's awesome. Um, do you remember the first song you ever wrote? Ever wrote? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I still play it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's called Every Morning After. And uh, it was um, a version of it was on, I put it out on an album called um, Thursday's Monster uh, okay. some some years ago. But yeah, I played actually quite a bit. That's awesome. <laughs> um, your first performance. Mm. So the first, it's kind of cloudy, but the first kind of paid performance, I guess, would be on Queen Street. Um, it was a festival that was organized in the say like eight late eighties, something like that. And um, I can't remember what it was called. And yeah, I just, I played that outside. And just you performing? Uh, a friend and I. So I, I think I did a set and then he and I did a set together. Awesome, very cool. Yeah. Uh, were you asked to join in on that? I think I sought it, sought it out. I, I think I'd been playing for, I think I played like for seven years before I actually played in public other wow. than like for yeah. friends or whatever. And um, I think I saw it advertised, if I remember correctly. And it was it was Sue Roy, who was one of the organizers, and uh, Peter White actually was the other organizer. Interesting. Yeah. Um, did you continue in schooling in any other field? Yes. So um, I spotted educational history. So I, <laughs> <laughs> when I finished high school, I went to Algoma for a year and a half, and then I dropped out. 
and I went to British Columbia and, and just played music and uh, worked odd jobs and went to school there for a little bit at a community college and came back here late 90s in, and then early 2000s, I, I went back to Algoma, finished my BA, and then I went to Laurier, worked for Laurier in um, <laughs> Waterloo. And uh, thank you. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and did a master's. And then, yeah, so I've been teaching uh, for almost 20 years. Now. Yeah. yeah. So tell me about uh, your current role <laughs> at Sioux College, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I started there in 2005, it was, and a part-time, and I worked contract for maybe six years or so. And then I was working, I was also teaching at Lake State, Bay Mills, and Algoma University oh. at the same time. <laughs> so like just kind of traveling between these four institutions. Did that for a number of years. And then about six years in, Sioux College offered me a full-time job, so I've been there since. That's awesome. What yeah. classes do you teach? I teach um, a lot of the classes that you have to take, but you don't want to take. <laughs> a lot of the writing and, and uh, report writing and technical writing courses. And then I also teach in general arts and science, so I, I'm spoiled. I get to do like music history, uh, creative writing, literature, wow. uh, stuff like that. So I, I do get to teach in my passion uh, field, so... I am very fortunate. Yeah, that you're always in it. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, what are your students like? What, what do you learn from them oh, equally man. as you teach to them? <laughs> oh, man. It's a cliche. Like other, many people have said this, but teaching has made me a better person, I find. Like it's just, um, I have a tendency to look on the negative side of things. Mm -hmm. And you can't be that person if you're to be effective as a teacher because it's, they're, they're there because they're hopeful. They're there because they right. want something and they see a future. So that has really transformed my my thinking and, and just sort of uh, uh, that energy and, and that hopefulness, you know. Um, yeah. And I think they're marvelous. I, I really like them. That's Not all of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Can't get along with everyone. <laughs> That's right. But generally, they're really great. That's awesome. So what's the most, uh, I guess, fulfilling part of being a teacher? Oh, wow. Um, I like, um, and my whole purpose is, like, if you can help someone find out what they're passionate about, or at least that they, they probably already know, but help them clear the way so that they can access it, that's really cool. And I, I find, like, a lot of my role as a teacher is just kind of, observing and pointing like mm. you, you don't really it's almost um and i find that the longer i go at it um the, the less i do in a way that doesn't sound right i'm not <laughs> doing anything at all you know you do a lot but like it's all behind scenes and right. they're doing it all and you, you just have to you participate and that that's what i'm trying to say so the the really wonderful part for me is just you get a chance to be um in a place where um something important has occurred to someone or they've realized something about themselves or their abilities and you're there to witness it. Yeah. And that's yeah. pretty cool. That is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, do any of them perform like you? Are they musicians like you? Obviously, they're taking those courses, so. Yeah, there's no performance in the classes I teach. And I, I'm i kind of bad at this. Like, I, I kind of compartmentalize it a bit. I don't, like, at, at work, at school, I'm not walking around talking about, like, my music and stuff right. like that. I keep it. And not for any reason. It's just I don't. I'm, I don't really walk around talking about it, anyways. Yeah. Like it's a, kind of just the thing I do. Um, but there are a lot of performers and a lot of writers. And this term, doing a creative writing class, was really wonderful. Writers in it. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Um, so you have released nine albums. Is that correct? Yeah. Uh, do you know all the names of all of them? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> you want them? Yeah, oh, sure. Okay. The first one was, some of them are cassettes, so they kind of, they're no longer available. The first mm -hmm. one I think was called After the Great Sleep, and it was um, a collection of like six songs that I recorded in this cabin in, in Burnaby, British Columbia. And then uh, I think there's one called Shadow Show. I don't remember all the names of them. The most recent one, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, is uh, The River Lately. Uh, yes. And then... The last few years, I've just been putting out some uh, singles. Singles, yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. 
I asked that question because I feel like a lot of artists come in here and they're like, I don't even remember <laughs> what I made. So I always think that's yeah, really yeah. fascinating that you artists spend so much time and effort and put into something and then they and then eventually. Oh yeah. 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 Oh the, yeah. There are songs that um, I don't because I don't also I don't listen to it right yes. so. Um, but when I'll be getting ready to, if I'm doing, some, if I'm playing somewhere and I have to build up a repertoire, mm-hmm. I'll look through my own songs. It's like, well, that, that's not mine. <laughs> you know, so yeah. So that's kind of a cool thing to rediscover your own work. I think that's yeah. It can be. Yeah. <laughs> it also be a great disappointment. Oh, no. <laughs> true, but that's just what you grow. Yeah, you know? that's right. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, how would you describe your music? Maybe in like a genre or like an essence, if you. Well, probably like folk singer songwriter yeah. stuff. Yeah, that'd be it. Um, you take a lot of inspiration from the Sioux and its natural beauty, especially in your latest album. Um, so, what about the area that you love and translate into your music? Ooh, nice. Um, it's it's an amazing area. I mean, like it's so ecologically diverse. Mm-hmm. Like we can, and it has all these little little places. Like you, you know, you go down to Whitefish, and it's a whole world in itself. You can you can explore that for months. You know, yes. And uh, that's just one spot. And then, um, it, just everything. I, I'm attracted to water, I guess, mm-hmm. and probably just being born here. And so everywhere I've lived has been near water and. Uh, so I like I like walking the river, and I did this thing for many years where I'd walk the same path almost every day along the river to the park. And you know, a lot of people say, "Oh, that's boring. Like, why don't you go somewhere else?" But the thing is, if you walk the same path every day, it's never the same. Like things right. are changing, and you notice things. You know. Yeah, notice the simple things like the flowers. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, and the seasonal change, and um, and then the fact that we have wilderness just twenty minutes away or yeah. whatever, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really cool place. We're pretty lucky here. Mm-hmm. So, how you collaborated with other artists? In what ways? Like, have you been in bands or mm-hmm. for your own albums? Yeah, yeah. I think everything is a collaboration, mm-hmm. and I, I, I've struggled with that because I've always, it's just been. I always thought it was just me playing a guitar and singing, so that's all it has to be, and not include anybody else, and nothing happens. Right. Um, yeah, I've been in lots of well, a number of bands. Um, over the years and uh in every sort of project i do like i i um gather a team and and work with with people yeah so but yeah there's been quite a few yeah bands over the years that's cool because you uh, know the names of these bands. <laughs> <laughs> i know them all yeah, yeah. um well in the sioux we had um uh, burnt toast was the first burnt band toast. yeah well they're a legendary band <laughs> <laughs> from the 90s and uh, we put out i think one cassette and played we played quite a bit and um uh it was like greg martin was in that probably in cliff alloy who plays a lot around town and uh frank duresti was in that band too and uh and then we had a an offshoot of that called uncle osap and the collection agency because we all had student debt and <laughs> um and then usually what i'll do is i'll have a project and then the the band will be be that project so I had like an album which was country songs and I had the clay rooster band okay and then um yeah that kind of thing that's pretty cool that's a cool yeah way to look at it maybe go over like your latest album like how sure. did that go about um come together and who did you collaborate with to produce okay. that um could I talk about a couple singles sure because oh, cool. they're they're new so I just did um two singles one was released it's called car alarm and i recorded that with um, uh, bill priddle and dustin goodall and uh, blair st john uh, at dustin goodall studio and uh really happy with we did it over a weekend uh, the two songs and um the first one's released the next one will be released i think in march and um that was really fun there was great guys to, <coughs> to work with and um so i played guitar and sang and then bill Priddle played um, bass and did a little bit of guitar, and then Blair St. John on drums, and then Dustin was the the technical guy. Okay, he, cool. He did all that stuff. Very cool. <laughs> so, do you come to them with kind of the idea of the song laid out? What what comes first, and how does that? Oh. Yeah. Yeah, more or less, I'll have the song with with. Um, so Bill Priddle produced these songs, and uh, with him, it was fun because 
we did pre-production, which um, was kind of a new experience for me. Like usually I write a song, I'll book time with someone, I'll go in and I'll just play it and we'll record it until we get a decent version. But uh, yeah, Bill is very meticulous. So we would sit and play the song over and over again. And he made great suggestions that uh, ultimately had me change the song, which right. didn't hasn't really happened a lot over the years, just because I guess I'm stubborn. But uh, <laughs> so that was I was really grateful for that process because we ended up with I mean we're better songs for that yeah. for that input. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. cool. Let's talk about performance. Mm -hmm. I actually watched the end of your performance at Rotary Fest last year, and it mm. was it was awesome. So I want to know what performing is like for you, and how often do you perform? What's the process of prepping and all of that? So oh starting God. with what is performing like for you? Oh jeez. <laughs> <laughs> mm. um, yeah, it, I like it. I'm drawn to it. Um, I feel compelled to do it, and yet I hate it. <laughs> At the same time and and when i'm doing it i'm fine usually I, I quite like it and i like you know playing to people and seeing them there and if they're into it that's really cool mm -hmm. um i've played a lot of bars and i've played a lot of places that didn't really want music or my music mm -hmm. so i've had a lot of negative experiences with playing live and um and some of it i think is just my attitude i'm generally shy yeah so uh, it takes a lot to do. As I get older, though, um, one thing for you young people to think about. <laughs> a lot of the anxieties that one has as a younger person fade. Right. And I don't, in my case, it might just be, I'm just forgetting to be nervous. Mm -hmm. But you generally just have more things to think about. And um, and then you realize that none of this is, is really life-threatening. So. Right. So it is getting better. And uh, I'll be doing a lot more uh, this year and going forward. Um, I do like it, and but I find it nerve-wracking. Preparation. So, yeah, I prepare. Um, <laughs> when I'm not playing out, my repertoire just dwindles down to like about five or six songs that I'm okay. working on. And then when I start to, to think about playing, I, I build that up with about, you know, half cover tunes and half my own. Right. And, um, and then I just, I just obsessively play for yeah hours and hours and hours yeah <laughs> perfecting the set. yeah i guess so i i don't like i guess i don't believe in perfection but i yes. i believe in the pursuit of perfection yes yeah i, I agree i'll never get there <laughs> that's the journey that's the process yeah. so how do you feel when you're you feel good when you're on stage yeah how, how do you combat in the moment the pressures of doing that usually like before the, there'll be like a physical i've often found like there's, I'll have a physical response. Usually it's mm -hmm. nausea. And I'll just feel like, oh, I can't do this. I'm, I'm going to be sick. And um, But I have found if that doesn't happen, then the performance is probably not that, not as good as I'd like it to be. Right. Because I think, I, I don't know what that part is, but once I get up there, I'm usually okay. Yeah. And then um, I just, it's just a matter of letting it, letting it happen. And it's a mixture of like, consciously thinking about what you're doing like the parts you have to do and how this goes and that and then another part of standing back and letting it happen so you, you're kind of in this constant observing yourself and um actually just so absorbed in that you don't really think about anything else but it is an interesting phenomenon like pain if you're in pain or something like that it's, it doesn't exist there on mm -hmm. the stage when you're playing um like all, all that stuff, you could be really worried about something in your life. And as soon as you start, it just, everything else fades away. And then, and then it's over before you know it. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> I think it's a, another thing because it's, you're so in your element when you're up there too, right? Like, I think that's the, mm -hmm. the big factor of it. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, so I came across um, one of your songs, Landlords and Grocery Store. Oh, yeah. Um, so I know that one of your major influences is Bruce Coburn, as we're going to talk about later, and he's written a number of songs like in political social justice issues. Yeah. So I, I wonder if that was like a big influence on that song, and if you can talk a little bit more about about that. Sure, that's a yeah, you're very astute. <laughs> I think even like for sure, like when I first, well, I mean, when I was younger, I was in when I was a kid, I was into the Beatles. And so Beatles and John Lennon had social conscience and 
they you know wrote songs about issues and things like that. So that wasn't new right. exactly, but and Bob Dylan too. And, but when I discovered Bruce Coburn, I was fourteen, and that seemed to be a whole other level of engagement politically. And so it did um, inspire me. And but more than that, it kind of opened up the possibility that you could you could write. Well, it's possible to write memorable songs about about issues. The other thing about that, it's really hard to do. And Bernie Finkelstein, who's Bruce Coburn's manager and the founder of True North Records, has a great line in this book. He goes, it's very easy to write a bad song about war. Mm, yeah. And that's part of the thing. Like if you focus so much on the issue um, and you have an agenda going in, it's usually not going to turn out very well, I, I, in my experience at least. Landlords and Grocery Stores is a funny song because I think I ripped it off from Bruce Coburn. Like the music of it, certainly the uh, the opening riff, I think I could probably find in about three or four different Coburn songs that I looked for it. Um, so there's that element too. Like it's, I think it's quite reminiscent of some of his melodies. Um, and that that song, I didn't go into it thinking you know of a purpose, but it was just the phrase "landlords and grocery stores." And um, there was something I would say in conversation where someone would be talking about, you know, the burden on the taxpayer with the welfare and all this stuff, right? And I'd say, no, no, all that money just goes to landlords and grocery stores. Like, people aren't saving that money or profiting from it. Right. And then it just built up that way. And then there was a character in the song who was having that experience. And uh, I read that some of the flat, like, funds raised went to the soup kitchen and other issues to raise awareness around this kind of topic, right? Yeah, yeah. that one is um, earmarked for the soup kitchen. Yeah. And there's, you know, it's uh, there's not a lot of donation from it, but right. whatever comes in goes there. Yeah. That's awesome. That's very cool. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get more into the book then. Two pages of notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. that's awesome. No, I'm very impressed. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, so the book is titled "You Get Bigger as You Go," mm -hmm. and it's a book on Bruce Coburn's life and an influential Canadian music mm -hmm. musician. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say more on his music. There's a there's a section on the editor I worked with is um, uh, Alistair Thompson from North Bay and. The original version I gave him, he said, uh, he just told me, like, you have to do something on his biography. You can't just let it. So there's a biographical section that ties into um, sort of the Canadian music scene at that time and how it was developing as he was developing. Okay. Um, but I don't go into his life, his personal life, really at all. Like, um, I, I tried to be respectful and mm. just sort of talk about the music. That's awesome. So who is Bruce Coburn for people that don't know? Sure. Yeah, well, Bruce Coburn is one of the uh, foundational singer-songwriters of the 1960s, 70s era, um, Canadian, born in Ottawa in 1945. And uh, his first album came out in 1970. It's a self-titled album, and it's, it's really, it's beautiful. It's a kind of simpler folk songs. And then over the span of this amazing 55 year career he's had, um, you just see his music develop and change, um, and but stay the same. It's he's always consistently Bruce, but you know he, he becomes this kind of this guitar god, and you wouldn't like that if you heard that, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, like and uh, like jazz influences and, and all kinds of things. But he's a very significant Canadian songwriter and who's been um, a very engaged activist um, with uh, a number of. Um, nonprofit organizations and, and causes throughout the decades. Very cool. Um, so, what was your first interactive interaction with his music? When I was fourteen, I found a cassette called "Joy Will Find a Way" in a in a bargain bin in a rec record store, and that album came out in nineteen seventy five, I think. So, it was about um, almost ten years later that I found it, and there was no information. It was just sort of a, of a drawing on the cover. Um, which was sort of this painting of um, a little girl with all these kind of animals, like a lion and a deer and birds and mountains behind and stuff like that. And uh, it's kind of creepy. Like it just gets a little eerie. 
And then it's, uh, it just reminded me of like a Cat Stevens album cover, which I really liked at the time. Didn't know who Bruce Coburn was and uh, put that cassette on and didn't know really what to make of the music, but I just kept listening to it. And he had some guitar pieces on there that I'd been playing for about a year. Um, I didn't even recognize it as a guitar because it made sounds that my guitar would never make. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I always wondered what kind of instrument is this that he's playing? Mm -hmm. And that was the start. And then, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I found a few more things and an older friend made a copy of this double live album that he had from the seventies. And then uh, a few years after that, um, I guess 80, 1986, um, so three, literally three years after I found that first album, uh, Bruce's album World of Wonders came out and, um, and I bought that the day it came out. So that was kind of it. And I didn't like, I listened to, I listened to every album I could find, but um, I, in the nineties, I didn't kind of go and listen to all the albums. And uh, so I kind of fell away for many years right. as well. Yeah. So how has this music influenced you personally? on so many levels like musically i think it has in a way because i can't play anywhere near like him but anything you listen to comes out right and you and um um but in other ways too i mean his music a lot of people say this um once in a while something will be going on in my life and um a lyric from bruce and other people too but Bruce Coburn lyric will just like come back. I haven't thought of the song in years, but there it is. And just a line that's just perfect, right? right. And so in that way too, I think he's, uh, his music is, has uh, influenced me and been like a guide and a friend, you know, through, through m most of my life. Awesome. Um, when did you first meet Bruce? Um, meet. I guess it was in twenty. 14 or something like that 2014 yeah in Newfoundland wow. so I've seen him I saw him in concert a few times and then um, we were in um, a little place in Newfoundland and turned out he was playing <clears throat> we found that out before we booked but that was the we weren't going there to see Bruce but we were going and then we found out he was playing so we went to the concert and afterward he was signing stuff and I thought well this is I should just say hi, you know, because I'll never get the chance to do that again. <laughs> so waited in line. And I think I even brought an album for him to sign and, and he signed that. And um, I can't remember. Well, I do remember actually what I said to him. It's in the book. Yeah. Um, I, told, I, I thought like, well, there were all these people lined up and everyone is telling him basically like how amazing he is right. and like how much he, music's meant to him and you could just see him like he seemed like very gracious about it but also not very comfortable with it and so i'm getting up there and i thought well that's what you do so i just told him like you know your music is like made me a better person or something something grand and he just kind of went oh <laughs> like that is like and he just i think he said something like um um I'm glad my music has a place in your life. And that, that was it. But you could tell he was not very comfortable with, right. <laughs> with that idea. Constant praise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. Very interesting. Um, so let's go into more of the... So this is not your first publication of a, a book. You mm -hmm. have three other poetry books, is that right? Yeah. So why do you choose to create this biography? Mm. <laughs> it it kind of... It just sort of happened like... Um, I guess in 2014, I, uh, I used to do a lot of freelance writing and a lot of journalism. And when I started teaching more, I didn't have time to, to do that. And um, also didn't have the need because like a lot of the writing jobs I had were things I wasn't really interested in. Mm -hmm. you, just, you have to be interested in them. Yeah. Um, I was doing it for money and um, mostly. And uh, so I just kind of thought, well, I still want to do stuff. and. Uh, what do I want to do? So I thought, well, maybe interview some people or write about some music. And I thought, who would I want to interview? Bruce Coburn. So I asked and um, found a publication that wanted an, an interview. And um, 
interviewed him in 2014. And it, wow. yeah, I think it went okay. Uh, and then I think I reviewed, he had an album that came out after that I reviewed and then I got to interview him the following year again. And uh, he's very generous. Like <clears throat> the, you know, the first article was a couple of pages, but we talked for like two hours, right? Mm. Like I said, two hours of tape from the first um, conversation. And then it was always like that. And so by the end, or well, not the end, but like, it hasn't <laughs> ended yet. <laughs> it's still going. Um, so over a couple of years, I was uh, just writing some articles about his music. And, and then um, I realized that, you know, I don't, I didn't know all of his albums mm. even. So I went back and I started listening to everything and I just keep notes. And then I kind of it kept, these notes kept expanding and I kept finding more uh, connections to, to other uh, interviews that he'd done. And then I started talking to people about Bruce and um, uh, and recording those conversations. Okay. And then I realized, hey, this could be a book of some kind. And um, so about 2016, I realized it could be a book. And then it was like seven years of kind of working on it and thinking it's not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. It's just kind of whatever, just accumulating. And But it, it wouldn't leave me alone. And I kept coming back to it and people kept responding. Wow. So, um, and then it just kind of, it's kind of built like that, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. That's so cool that it came from like more of a passion project and slowly developed and took its time. Um, so who did you interview? Like sure. some of the names, some of the people, yeah. the groups? So um, <clears throat> I had um, five recorded sessions with Bruce Coburn with about seven hours of material or more. And then his manager, Bernie Finkelstein, who was like, I can't over, I can't uh, exaggerate his role in Canadian music. We, we wouldn't have the Canadian music scene we have now without Bernie Finkelstein. Um, so talked to him quite a bit. Um, and then musicians like Don Ross, who's just this phenomenal guitar player. He's actually coming here in April to play. Um, and, and then I got to talk to three of Bruce's producers, uh, Colin Linden, Jonathan Goldsmith, um, Eugene Martinek, his first producer, and then Linda Manzer, the, the luthier, the guitar builder. Um, and, oh, and then a lot of activists too. And I spoke with uh, people from um, this organization called Seed Change that Bruce has been involved with for 50 years. And um, some of the people he went with um, into Central America when he wrote um, If I Had a Rocket Launcher about the, um, the refugee camps <laughs> in, in Mexico, the refugee camps in Mexico of, of Guatemalan uh, refugees who were being um, murdered by their own government, basically. And um, so I talked to the people that brought him there. Wow. And uh, yeah, so there's, there's quite a few more. Yeah. I forget some people. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, how hard was it to get a hold of these people like, get in touch with them? How eager were they to participate in a project like this? Yeah, so some of them were a little bit more challenging to get. Um, and there were some that I made the request and they never got mm-hmm. back to me. So they didn't want to be talk- or didn't want to talk about it. Yeah. But the people who spoke were really generous and, um, and, and willing, to, willing to talk. So, and it took a while. Like Jonathan Goldsmith was hard to track down. He, um, he doesn't have a social media presence and he you know, just does these beautiful soundtracks to Hollywood movies now. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I finally got through to him and um, Colin Linden, uh, Bruce's current producer, was tricky too, but I, only, I think only just because he was always touring Colin. So. Mm-hmm. Um, but no one was like, I didn't have to you know, badger anyone. It was just mm-hmm. kind of I'd ask and if they said yes, we would have the conversation. That's awesome. So I guess maybe like turning the process of turning those interviews into the book. Um, what was that like? Cause I'm sure that's a, a challenge in itself. Yeah, it was hard. <laughs> <laughs> it was. And um, I gave up at least once. Um, so I had different versions and the, the first version, mm-hmm. I thought I was finished and I said, I'm finished. And then um, it was crazy. It was like a science fiction story. It had like a time travel element and, Part of it was about a guy writing a book about Bruce Coburn and 
It was just crazy. So it, cool. Yeah, yeah. They're, 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 <laughs> it was weird. And, the, and there's in the back of the book, there's a review section where I go through every album, every song, and I'll tie it into issues or if I have um, had conversations with like his producer about that song, we'll put that in there. Okay. And and then there's a lot of just me sort of reflecting on the song as well. Um, originally, that a lot of those reviews were in haiku. So I'd, do, I'd review a song and I'd write a haiku about the song. It was just madness. So I um, <laughs> had that. And then um, I had help from an editor, um, Alistair Thompson from North Bay. And uh, that was helpful because just to get a different perspective. And yeah. he kind of gave me some guidance that my next draft became more like a real book and kind of more closer to what this is. And I think I did three probably at least three complete drafts of the wow. really weird one and then the middle thing and then this version and then uh, you just kind of keep going over and over. Right. And um, so I say it took seven years, but, you know, I, all, I did other things, right. put out albums and worked, and um, but it was always on the side. And then um, in the last few years, I, I, yeah, I'd set time out to do it and I just every day. So I'd wake up in the morning and from morning until noon I'd work oh. on it and then the evening I'd do some more research and then yeah. I'd write in the mornings that's awesome just kind of every day put in the time put in the work yeah yeah, yeah. Um, has Bruce ever read the book yet I don't know he has a copy of the new version he read a part of that the crazy version the first version <laughs> yeah and uh, you know he must have saw something in it because he he gave me uh, an interview after that so he didn't, didn't just write it off and um and yeah so um that that's all i can really say about right. it did he have to give you permission like to write a book about his life how does that that kind of work it the, you don't really need as far as i know you don't maybe they're gonna sue me now would that be funny thanks for writing it i'm gonna sue you um you can write a book about someone i think but you especially i don't think they had any concerns because they I'd published and we'd spoken and I think they kind of had a sense about what I was about. Right. And they also knew that I wasn't interested at all in like his personal life and stuff like that. Um, so I was interested in the music. So I, I think like, well, every, a lot of the people I spoke to would tell me that they asked, they either reached out to him or to Bernie Finkelstein, his manager. Oh. And so they would give me little clues about, you know, Bruce said this about you or that kind of thing. So I had these little indications <laughs> that, I wasn't totally up to lunch about all this, and um, and I think too if what the line they gave gave me at the beginning was that we we won't endorse it, but we won't we won't stand in your way. Right. So, um, but I think if they weren't into it, uh, I would no, nobody would have talked to me. Right. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. So does that answer? Yeah, that answers the question. Yeah, that's sure. about <laughs> as close as I get because I, I don't know. Uh, so who is the book? For are they for seasoned fans, just music lovers? Yeah, yeah. That's the hard part because, like, yeah, who do you write it for? Um, <laughs> so the central thing to me was a question about music in general. Like, what is it about music that can transform our lives? Mm -hmm. Can change our thoughts? Can um, uh, you know just tr transform us and then allow us to transform our lives and thereby change the world? You know, I don't think music does that directly, but. Um, these are things I was thinking about and then I put that through a lens of Coburn mm -hmm. how has his music influenced me but everyone else you know who know, knows his music so it's a mixture I see it as a, a beginner's guide yeah. so I want I would really like it if people who maybe have heard the name or maybe their parents listen to this guy or whatever uh, read it and and just get interested in the music and in the possibility of what like a life dedicated to creativity um, can lead you to like yeah. to all kinds of um, difficult and wonderful uh, organizations or situations that um, you know that are actually doing things in the world and, and to see how our lives intersect with with broader issues mm -hmm. but I wrote it kind of for so I one of the classes I teach is called music and pop culture okay and um, Every year, fewer people would know. Uh, I talk about Bruce and this social revolution, social justice unit. 
and fewer people would know about them. So I thought, oh, this is sad. So one of my goals is like to pass it on, maybe um, like as a beginner's guide. And then um, for fans, there's nothing really new for like a hardcore fan, um, biographically or anything like that. The only thing they'll get that's new will be some perspectives that they right. haven't had before. So I, I hope it's a mixture. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So where can listeners get the book? Mm-hmm. So online, just about anywhere, Amazon, Chapters, Indigo, uh, any bookstore can order it. And then in Sault Ste. Marie, uh, the Rad Zone and Sault Ste. Marie Museum Yay. gift shop. <laughs> And what about your music, your own personal music? Where can listeners find that and listen? Um, online, if you go to my website, which is mddone.com, uh, that, that pretty much links you to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so I have one final question for you that sure. I've been asking everyone. Yeah. It is, say 100 years from now, the Sioux Museum has an exhibit on you. What would your headline or title of the exhibit be? And what three artifacts would be on display? What? Well, so in a hundred years is an exhibit on me. Yes. Oh my goodness. At the museum. Um, it would be, the title would be Maria Perella Larry's husband and, and partner and friend. <laughs> Very good choice. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, would, I would think there'd be, you know, something about uh, music and, and writing and um, I, that'd probably be it. Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe, you know, Something about education. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's a weird thought. <laughs> it is such a weird thought, but it's good. Well, what, what's your exhibit going to be? <laughs> it's not my interview. It's your interview. <laughs> 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 and what three artifacts? That one's always easier. Oh, three artifacts. Oh, cool. Um, a typewriter, mm-hmm. a guitar, and oh, hmm, what would the third be? Mm-hmm. One of my cats stuffed. <laughs> Taxidermy. <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, yeah, probably a guitar and a typewriter and um, you know, maybe a notebook, yeah. something like that. Yeah. Those are my, my three tools. <laughs> Perfect. <usually. laughs> what, another question. What keeps you in the practice of creating, like constantly every day? What compels you to pick up the guitar every day? Obsessiveness. Uh, um yeah, it, it's it's. Hard. I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. Like it's just sort of it's something I need to do. Yeah. If I don't play guitar, like I can go a week, probably, and then after that, like physically, I just start feeling mm. like like my now especially like my joints ache and and I just like I physically feel not good. Yeah. Um. So I miss it when I don't when I don't play. So is that um, and. Um, writing, I go through periods of concentrated writing where I'm usually it's project focus. I'm working on something. So be very diligent. I'll work just about every day, but mostly I, I kind of keep notes on things I've observed, just like a diary. Okay. And then that will maybe lead to a poem or a lyric or something like that. Um, I think it's just like practice like it's just you, you, you develop practice and you just keep going and yeah. it's like exercise if you if you get into an exercise program and then you don't do it you feel terrible i think that's probably a little bit of obsessiveness helps too yeah <laughs> any advice for a young budding artist or writer um well yeah uh well writers i'd say read yeah. Like read a lot. And, and that's the major tool. Like um, you really can't improve writing without reading. Like you need to read and you need to fall in love with it. Like genuinely. Right. And that, and a lot of people get blocked with writing or reading because it can be difficult, especially now. Like I find too, like I use the phone so much. It's like knocked off my, my attention span. Yeah. So it's harder <laughs> to get into a book. And what they don't tell us is that, reading is work like yeah. um when i started in high school to read seriously and lots um it was hard and but i knew that i'd get better at it and i think a lot of people stop just with the hard part and they say oh i don't like reading but you can actually learn to love it and it'll change everything so i'd say for writers read a lot um 
and, and write and you have to do that. Yeah. For musicians, I always say the same advice and that's um, get lessons, like learn theory. Um, you know, if, if you're serious about being a musician, um, play with people who are better than you mm -hmm. and you can learn stuff and, and just um, humble yourself to the practice. Like um, that it's, an, if whatever your instrument is, or if it's music theory in general, like you will, it's so big, you'll never master it and right. it's bottomless. And like, so you need to kind of humble yourself. And that's, I say that because I, I didn't do that. Like I didn't learn any theory and I re kind of regret that in my life sometimes. Um, so I'd say that, like be serious about it and learn from people who know. Great advice. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mark. It was <laughs> lovely. Thank you. <laughs> Yay! Hi, I'm JL Fazell, and I write and publish poetry inspired by nature and the art of being human. These are some of my words. This poem is from my second book, Pearls and Swine, and it's inspired by Northern Ontario and spring and the whole process of cleaning up potholes and making streets usable again. And it's called March Thaw. The biggest problem with being frozen and cold is that once you start to melt, you leave a war zone of puddles and po I hope this poem took you somewhere inside yourself that you needed to go. You can listen to my story here on the Stories of Northern Life podcast. Links are in the show notes. Have you been to your local museum lately? Visit us at the Sault Ste. Marie Museum, located in downtown Sault Ste. Marie, the one with the big clock tower on the top. Our hours of operation are 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Tuesday to Saturday. We have three floors of exhibits that we constantly work on updating. The whole family is welcome, as we have activity sheets and scavenger hunts with prizes for every kiddo, a discovery gallery full of hands-on learning, and more interactive elements scattered throughout the museum. And don't forget to come say hi and let us know you're a listener of the podcast. Mm -hmm.